Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our Black History Walk. My name is Katrina Bowman Thomas, Executive Director for Northern Kentucky Community Action Commission, and we are so glad that you're able to join us on today. Black history is American history, and today we are going to take a journey through Covington to learn together. Covington was founded in 1815, and it was considered a transition area. It was considered a place where there was a lot of innovation, as well as a place of malice and complacency. It was that transition that led us to do this walk, because as we look at our nation, we are in transition today. And they say you can't know where you're going until you understand where you've been. So we're gonna take time to really explore the depths and the ugliness of slavery. And we're going to also explore the highs of the Black Business District. We want to all do this together collectively so that we can learn from the mistakes of the past and also remember the times that we've been able to come together and really be stronger, wiser, and better. Because we know as a nation, that is when we thrive. And that's what we want to get to. So thank you so much for joining us on this walk. We hope that you learn, that you venture out, that you talk to others that you've never met before. So we can start a conversation so that again, we can come together as a nation. And we would like to thank our sponsors today, St. Elizabeth Healthcare, Trinity Episcopal Church, and Green Sky. Without their partnership, this walk would not be possible. So again, thank you for being here and enjoy the walk. St. Elizabeth is the largest healthcare system in Northern Kentucky. And our vision is to lead the Northern Kentucky region to become one of the healthiest communities in America. And in doing so, we have to work with every community to ensure that everyone in those communities are able to access healthcare without no barriers. So it is our passion, it is our pride, because NKCAC is also part of our people and working with them to address health and healthcare disparities in this region is very important for us. So we are very proud to be a sponsor and to partner with this community because we know that it doesn't matter who you are, you are part of this region, you're part of our community. And so we are proud, we are happy to actually be a part of this work that NKCAC is doing and to be a partner and to also enlighten this community, especially the African-American community, about their health and their health care and how they can access that health care. We are here for them. We have always been here for them. And so it is important for all of us to work together because together we can make a better Northern Kentucky and a healthier Northern Kentucky. We are so excited as a company to be able to support and help sponsor this year's Black History Walk, which is occurring on October 17th. The partnership that we have with um, the Northern Kentucky Community Action Commission has been a wonderful partnership and one that uh, we've really looked forward to, not only this event, but additional partnership opportunities. So this event in particular is just such an exciting opportunity to have a virtual walk through the Covington area to participate uh, with others in with the focus of understanding points of interest that are so crucial uh, for Black History Month and just the overall culture that we have in this region. As a supporter, again, we are excited. We're glad that you're able to participate. We hope that you have a wonderful day. Um, I'm so hopeful that the weather turns out and that everyone can come out and participate and just enjoy each other's time in the community that we have in Covington and the surrounding area. So thank you very much. And I wish everyone just a wonderful, wonderful event. Take care. On behalf of Northern Kentucky Community Action Commission, we just say thank you. Thank you for being a part of this day. Enjoy your time being out there and I look forward to meeting you. We are in the Carnegie Visual and Performing Arts Center, which was originally constructed as the Covington Public Library. 
The Covington Public Library began in the late 1800s by a group of citizens and city government who wanted to establish a free public library in the city. Prior to that time, there were several other smaller libraries, but they were all fee-based services. So they were looking for a way to come up with a library that would be free to all residents of Covington. The library started originally in 1901 on Madison Avenue in temporary quarters. And a couple of years later, they published their first rules. So it was a book of rules, and the rules specifically state that the library is open to every man, woman, and child in Covington. And that's a very important statement, because what it means is the library was never a segregated institution. So from our founding in 1901, um, the library has always been open to everyone. This is very unusual in the South and very unusual in Kentucky. This building was built in 1904 by the firm of John H. Bowl, who was a local resident. He lived in Ludlow, did a lot of work in Northern Kentucky. And it was built partially with a grant from the Carnegie. The grant was for 75,000. The building was built for a little over $87,000, if you can imagine, when it was constructed in 1904. In the 1930s, there was a study done by a Mrs. Elizabeth Gleason of Kentucky libraries, and she was looking for libraries that served African Americans in particular. And she discovered in the late 1930s that the Covington Public Library was indeed the only library in Kentucky that was desegregated. So we had never been a segregated institution. In 1940, there was a, an additional study made of the southeastern United States, there were five public libraries in 1940 uh, in the southeastern United States that were open to everyone, regardless of race. The Covington Public Library and four libraries in Texas. There was really no initial pushback on this from the very beginning. There was no newspaper articles. There was no discussion about it for the most part. We've done the research. And so it seemed to be widely accepted that that was an appropriate practice in Northern Kentucky. And so we've always been very proud now as part of the Kenton County Library System to say that the Covington Public Library has been open to everyone since our founding. If you look at the history of the African American population in Covington, it has changed over time. So if you're, we're looking at the late 1800s, there was a sizable African American population living on the west side, particularly on Washington Street. As the city developed and as housing changed and new immigrant groups began moving in, the African-American population slowly started moving east. The African-American school was established on 7th Street, just west of Madison in the 1860s. In the 1930s, the new Lincoln Grant School was built with a WPA grant. That solidified the east side as a predominantly African-American community. And so not only did it become residential, but uh, many of the African-American institutions moved to the east side. So first African-American Baptist, Lane CME, St. James CME, all became part of the east side neighborhood. And businesses followed. And so a number of African-American owned businesses from funeral homes to grocery stores, uh, began uh, establishing um, their locations on the east side to serve the African-American population. And so we typically um, look at the east side as being a, uh, a center of the African-American population. Jacob Price and Dr. James Randolph, two of the most important African-American leaders, had strong ties to the east side, as did Annie Hargroves, who uh, also was a very important figure in the African-American community. One important person to share with you today is Dr. James Randolph. James E. Randolph was the doctor for this community. Let me tell you about him. Dr. Randolph, born 1888, a doctor who overcame a lot of obstacles that existed during the 1800s, especially and into the early 1900s, by entering a field where blacks were really not accepted and a lot of people felt that blacks were not capable of becoming doctors or incapable of learning all of the complexity of the anatomy. But he proved them wrong by going to Meharry Medical School and graduating and in 1929 
moved to Covington to set up his practice up on Greenup Street, just a few blocks from here. The beauty of it was, from 1929 up until the time of his death in 1981, Dr. Randolph was pretty much the doctor that we knew. We didn't know anybody else but him because he provided service for us. A lot of the people had Dr. Randolph as their doctor, their personal physician, and part of the issue for him was he had to fulfill all roles, obstetrician, gynecologist, internist, and all of the other issues we face, ear, nose, throat. Dr. Randolph was an all-round doctor that took care of all of our ailments. Keep in mind, one other issue he had was referral. And the point being, many blacks could not be referred to a white doctor. So Dr. Randolph really had to provide all those services alone. He was eventually received into the local medical society, which was a unique experience because the AMA did not uh, permit African Americans to be a part of their organization until the 1950s and 1960s. So he was on the cutting edge of being a doctor to provide service to this community. He was our doctor. He cared for us when we were in school. He cared for us at home. He went to church in this community at St. James, and he was a long living resident of this neighborhood. And we so appreciated him. One of the neat things from the city's perspective, they named a park after him in 1975 prior to his demise. Randolph Park is an extension from 8th Street to a Robin Street, about three blocks that includes a baseball diamond, basketball courts, a swimming pool, a shelter, where we can gather on an annual basis. When I say annual basis, I'm particularly looking at the event we called Old Timers. That was started 36 years ago. And each year, the community as a whole would gather. We'd set up tents in the park. We'd have food vendors come and set up their trailers and trucks on the church property here at 9th Street to watch the games that would be played. It started with old timers because a lot of the people in this community were involved in sports. Uh, one particular team were the Black Hawk baseball players, and they would compete with other teams from Cincinnati, from Lexington, from Louisville, even as far as Virginia, Tennessee, and other parts of the country. When they'd come together to play for the whole weekend for 36 years, we enjoyed watching the games and their competition and appreciated how the whole time we never once had a major event. Just to share with you another person who overcame many, many obstacles, Jacob Price as a minister, Jacob Price as a businessman, and how in 1860 he was shown to be a free man, a free man during the time of enslavement in this country. I initially loved to have his story because of his involvement in this community. As a businessman, to see that he was in the business of lumber. He had his business set up on 4th and Madison Street here in Covington and provided much of the lumber that went into the homes that were built here on the east side. Some of those homes, we believe, are still standing either at the bottom of 11th Street or the bottom of Bush Street on the north side of Bush. I look further at him because he was an instigator in bringing the Baptist faith to this city. He was a preacher and a teacher, and his wife with him were teachers in their own home over on Bremen Street on the west side of Covington. 61 Bremen Street, well, it's not Bremen anymore. Now it's called Pershing. The street still exists and the address is still there, though the buildings themselves have been removed. On Bremen Street, where Reverend Price lived, he began the first African Baptist Church of Covington. That church is currently occupying a space at 120 East 9th Street, just a block away from here. First Baptist is the mother church for 9th Street Baptist. We came out of them back in 1869. 
With the help of Jacob Price, we now have the Lincoln Grant School that started on 6th Street and it grew to become a William Grant High School. And it's through his efforts, we not only have our churches that still exist today, but we also have his educational assistants that also still exist today. Benjamin Howard. Benjamin Howard, a friend of his, Arthur Riggs, they were able to see and investigate an organization called the BPOE, the Benevolent Paternal Order of Elks. But that was a white organization. And in 1897, they attempted to be a part of it, but they were refused membership. Riggs worked on the railroad. He met an individual who was of the BPOE, and he was able to get a copy of this ritual book. He brought it back, reviewed it with B.F. Howard, and in their reviewing, they found out that the book had not been copywritten. So they wanted to make it different, though, from the BPOE, so they added an I to the front of it called the Improved Benevolent Paternal Order of the Elks. And by virtue of that addition, that made this a black organization different from the white organization. B.F. Howard came to Covington. Riggs became threatened so much because of what he had done with the ritual book that he was able to copy from the person who gave it to him on the train. And he was threatened on the train when he would stop in a place in Birmingham, Alabama. His life was threatened when he came back here to Cincinnati. Eventually, he had to move away and take an assumed name in Springfield, Ohio. B.F. Howard, on the other hand, being a resident of Covington, brought the book with him, influenced a few of his friends, and that began the first chapter of the IBPOE here in Covington, Kentucky. They currently still meet on 11th Street at the corner of Garrett, still in this community after all these years. It's the improved benevolent paternal order of the Elks of the world because it is a worldwide organization that started here in Covington. Here at 231 East 9th Street, there was a building being used at that time by the St. James AME Church. 9th Street started occupying the building and in 1905, they purchased that property. The Reverend uh, William Taylor, as pastor in 1914, decided that their, the building really wasn't conducive to the kind of worship that they felt they should have. So in 1914, the cornerstone was laid in the basement of this church. And after seven years, the upper part was finally finished. And that building has been here since 1921. The past 20 to 25 years, we formed a nonprofit called Oasis. And the reason for that organization is to be a branch of 9th Street that could impact the community in politics and in offering assistance through substance abuse recovery as an after uh, program, and also help with the schooling of our kids by providing tutoring and mentoring and things of that nature. We work with senior citizens to help them uh, communicate with the city and deal with specific issues that they might have had. Covington is a religiously diverse community as well as a racially diverse community. Prior to 1943, African Americans were taking on the Catholic faith and they wanted to attend a worship service or a mass and at that time they were even doing it at what was then called uh, St. Mary's Catholic Church. St. Mary's is now called the Basilica of Covington. It has been elevated by the diocese to a basilica level. Well, in 1943, the person who was bishop at that time determined that the black community might be better served if they had their own place of worship. Our savior, Catholic Church, was started. So the church was built in 1943, along with a small wing that was added for educational purposes. From that school, that was giving classes from the first to the eighth grade, many of the black community 
were able to go to that school uh, to gain an education. It created an option for them as opposed to the public school, which was here called Lincoln Grant. Keep in mind, Lincoln Grant was built in 1931 specifically for the black community. Our Savior was built 1943 specifically for the black community. Further, Jacob Price Homes, 1939, was built specifically for the black community. There were those who wanted to main what they called separate but equal, which was found in 1955 in the Brown versus Board of Education not to be true. And from the 1955 date, all of these various institutions, Lincoln Grant School, Our Savior School, Jacob Price Homes, have all been removed and changed so that our Savior no longer has a school. There are those who still worship in its chapel, but it doesn't have the significance that it had back in the 1940s and the 1950s. There was a time they had up to 60 children going to our Savior school from the first to the eighth grade. After the 1955, that school was then closed down and students were dispersed to other locations in addition to coming to the public schools here at Lincoln Grant. Such was our savior, such as Ninth Street Baptist, such as First Baptist, as far as churches are concerned, all of us still meeting the religious needs of our community. Here we are at the Lincoln Grant School, a very historical, extraordinarily historical location in the Covington community. Is it a historical relic or is it a model of the future? As a unit itself, it goes way back, I think, to the beginning of the 20th century. But the building was built in 1931. And between 1932 and 1965, operated as Lincoln Grant School, incorporating youngsters from kindergarten all the way to the 12th grade. It was a school that existed during the days of educational segregation, when segregation was legal, uh, made legal by the Plessy versus Ferguson decision of the Supreme Court in 1896. <clears throat> and of course, um, the Brown decision of 1954 will basically make education and segregation illegal. And this school would last until 1965, where it had to become integrated. A very important school in the sense of building character. Once it ceased to become an educational institution, it became a community center. And that lasted until the early part of the 21st century, around 2003, and has since become a, a residence, a home for single parents, a home that encourages them to get their education, a home that encourages them to uh, be gainfully employed as they pursue life. So this building is a very historic building. It's been the center of the community. There's a community surrounding this area, roughly from 8th to 12th Street. And that community goes way back into the days of segregation. Oh, tenements, some of the tenements from those old days are still here, still surrounding the, the facility. People think that this was just a high school that served the local area. 
And this place has produced some very notable people. Some of the people still live here, such as Reverend Fowler, who has, is the pastor, of, longtime pastor of Ninth Street Baptist Church, Patricia Humphreys Fan, a person who founded the uh, black newspaper called the Suspension Press, and there are numerous other ones, including people who have passed away, great athletes such as George Stone. So let me, for instance, read to you a, a, what Wikipedia says about George Stone, a basketball player who attended this very school. It says, George E. Stone, born February 9th, 1946, died December 30th, 1993, was an American professional basketball player who spent several seasons in the American Basketball Association, the ABA. He was drafted in the ninth round of the 1968 NBA draft by the Los Angeles Lakers, but never played for them or any other NBA team. A six foot seven forward from Marshall University, Stone played four seasons, 1968 to 1972, in the ABA as a member of the Los Angeles Stars, Utah Stars, and Carolina Cougars. He averaged 13.6 points per game over the course of his career and ranked 10th in ABA history in three-point field goal percentage. He also won a league championship with the Utah Stars in 1971. Stone died of a heart attack on December 30th, 1993. <clears throat> so here we find this location, local African-American community producing extraordinary human beings. Welcome to the Licking Riverside National Register District here in Covington, Kentucky. Right behind me is the oldest house in the city of Covington. It was built um, around 1816, 1817 for Thomas D. Carneal. We think that the house itself was actually meant to be kind of a model home for the new city of Covington. And we know as early as about February of 1816, we have paperwork that shows that Carneal was contracting with a couple of brothers, uh, the Buckner brothers, to provide joinery, that is carpentry work, for this new home. And in exchange for their carpentry work, they were to receive some 70,000 bricks from the brickyard probably of Thomas Carneal himself here in Covington, Kentucky. So if you look at this house, you can see it's called the Gano Southgate House because the first owner was Aaron Gano. And so he, was, he had purchased the property about 1820 and by 1825, he sold the property to William Wright Southgate. Now the Southgate family was a well-known family from Virginia. And it was very well known in terms of politics and in terms of science and a lot of other different uh, areas of expertise. They lived in this house and the Southgates had 13 children. So this immense house, they needed a little addition. So the addition part of this house, which is towards the back, was built in 1835. And they not only eventually had that many children, but after William Wright Southgate died and it continued in the family, there were other kind of family members that also lived with them. So at one time there were as many probably as 20 people or so living in this giant house behind me. Now among those 20 people were a few slaves who lived in a slave quarters behind the house. There were also two free black men, Thomas and Nelson Fishback. One was in his 70s and probably his son was in his 40s. And they probably served in a capacity of like butlers for this house. This would have been a house that would have been typical of the South and its so-called hospitality of the day and would have entertained a lot of different people over the years. What I like to point out about this house is that it does have a service tunnel 
and the service tunnel leads towards the Licking River. So that would have been the place where people would have delivered supplies into the house. You wouldn't have wanted to take supplies in the front door and right through all the beautiful um, woodwork, the wood floors, etc. You would have wanted to bring supplies in and brought them in towards the basement and stored them in the cooler basement. Some people suggest that it might have been used as uh, part of the Underground Railroad, that is, to help enslaved people's um, escape. That theory probably is, is not actually true, but I suppose we'll never really know. For one thing, there were many people who lived in this house and it would have been fairly difficult to have kind of an Underground Railroad activity occurring. The other reason why I like to point out this house is because it really represents the old era, the past of Covington. This represents the past, but already by the 1840s and the 1850s, this sort of past was disappearing, or it would disappear very soon. And instead, right across the street, we have what is now Governor's Point Condominiums. And it is an old hospital called Booth Hospital. It was originally a gift of the Schenkel family of their homestead, which had been built in the 1860s, late 1860s, after the Civil War. And Amos Schenkel, who built that house that became a hospital, was actually known as a great philanthropist. And there couldn't be a greater difference between the Gano Southgate house and the Southgate family who owned slaves and Amos Schenkel who did not own slaves, was born in Ohio and was a union man. If we just walk a block away from here, we're going to see a statue to a black man by the name of James Bradley. His story is absolutely amazing. He was born into freedom in Africa, and then he was captured by a slave trader, brought to South Carolina, and then sold to a plantation owner in a county south of here called Pendleton County. And that plantation owner's name was Bradley. Hence, James Bradley took his name from that owner. He then was traded off and sold to a, a plantation in Arkansas where he was allowed to work overtime in the evenings, etc., for neighboring plantation owners and allowed to keep that income. He saved a phenomenal $700 doing extra work and as he said, some evenings he only got a few hours sleep. He bought his freedom, came up to Covington for a short while, and crossed right around probably where his statue is, over into Ohio. And there in Cincinnati, he became the first African-American man to enroll in Lane Seminary. And there he took part in some very famous anti-slavery debates called the Lane Seminary Debates of 1834. He then went north and was at a labor school of Oberlin College, which was one of the earliest integrated colleges in America. And after that, unfortunately, as of this time, we don't know what happened to him. But he, again, is a symbol of the old past, things that were disappearing and diminishing. And instead, he was a man of the future. Not far from the statue, you can see the beautiful John Roebling Suspension Bridge. When it was completed and opened for all traffic on New Year's Day in 1867, it was the world's longest suspension bridge. And it was the product of an engineer who had been born in Germany by the name of John Roebling. He became a noted bridge designer and came to Covington to design the Covington and Cincinnati 
Suspension Bridge, as it was called then. In 1846, the Kentucky General Assembly passed the charter for the bridge company, but with a very important amendment that clearly stated that if the company or its agents had any willful knowledge of a slave running away across the bridge that they had to indemnify to pay that slave owner. Well, when the charter then moved to the General Assembly in Columbus in the state of Ohio, the senators there were absolutely abhorred by this feature. They did not support slavery and they did not understand why there needed to be such an amendment. The Ohio General Assembly did not pass the charter. Instead, it was taken back up in 1849 by the Ohio General Assembly in Columbus, and they added two amendments to the bridge charter. Both of them were very important. One said that if any runaway slave escaped across the new bridge once it was constructed, that no Ohio state courts would take up the, the slave case. And that was to protect the courts from having to make decisions to send runaway slaves back to slavery themselves. The second amendment dealt with Ohio holding to the fact that it claimed its boundary with Kentucky was the midpoint of the Ohio River. Well, the Kentucky General Assembly was absolutely, completely antagonized by all of this. And they said that they were ready to revoke the whole charter to the bridge company. And so this back and forth kind of occurred because of lobbying on the behalf of bridge company officials and Covington people, the charter was not revoked. But on the other hand, in 1850, Ohio passed yet another amendment. And this one has very much significance and relevance to all of us today. It said that the bridge company could not align its bridge with any Cincinnati street running north-south. This was absolutely crucial because when Covington had been platted and incorporated as a town in 1815, the engineers had made Covington's north-south streets like Greenup line up exactly with the north-south streets in Cincinnati, Greenup with Walnut, for instance, in Cincinnati, and that's where the bridge really was seemingly going to go. This meant that the bridge company would have to take on another hurdle. It would have to buy up more property on its own in between the streets, in the blocks in between, in order to put its access ramps. This is kind of a sticking their tongue out at a bridge company that they saw as, in Ohio as run by Kentuckians who supported slavery. It was their way of saying, we're paying tax money to support the streets and the infrastructure of Cincinnati, and we don't want your bridge company using our streets for nothing. We're making a moral statement, an ethical statement. Well, that was one of the reasons why the bridge never lined up with any Cincinnati Street or any Covington Street, depriving the engineer John Roebling of what he hoped would have been a beautiful boulevard stretching from shore to shore and visible for miles as it was illuminated by gas lights. Today, we've been trying to fix that ever since. There's a roundabout on the Cincinnati side. There's a yoke on the Kentucky side. I think when we cross the bridge, we ought to look at that bridge as a symbol of that moral rectitude. We are here in the Trinity Episcopal Church in the very spot where this church was founded in 1843. And 13 years later, uh, we had perhaps the most consequential Black History March in Covington. 
and that was on January 27th of 1856 when Margaret Garner and her family, having escaped from slavery further south, walked across the ice-covered Ohio River to supposedly freedom in Ohio. And one of Margaret's cousins lived near Mill Creek on the Cincinnati side, so they walked to Mill Creek. Arrangements had been made for the Underground Railroad to pick them up and transport them to the north where they'd be safer than staying near the river here. And before that happened, uh, the slaveholders from Kentucky arrived with a federal marshal and a warrant for their arrest as fugitives under the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law. Robert had a pistol that he'd taken just in case and he tried to resist. While that was happening, Margaret intended to kill all four children and then herself to keep any of them from having to return to enslavement. She did kill her two-year-old daughter, Mary, before they could stop her. Then the arrests were made. They were put into the Hammond Street Jail in Cincinnati, and the court case ensued. It was very broadly covered both locally and nationally, uh, quite like the George Floyd case was this summer. And it was a very interesting case from the legal point of view because under federal law, it was pretty clear they were fugitives. They were property who had stolen themselves from their masters and they would have to be returned as soon as they could be identified as the property of the Gaines and Marshall family. The abolitionist lawyer who defended them on the Cincinnati side, John Jolliffe, wanted to have them tried on Ohio law and to try Margaret for murder because this was a criminal crime that took place in Ohio as opposed to a domestic civil crime that took place out of Kentucky and he was arguing that should take precedence. There was a lot of legal back and forth um, and the trial lasted for about a month until finally the federal commissioner rendered his decision and that was to send them back to Kentucky uh, and they were therefore installed in the uh, jail right here in Covington, about a block from this church, uh, so that the marshals and Gaineses could send them south. Uh, could, and uh, Gaines, in fact, did send them south soon after this happened. He had relatives in Arkansas, uh, and uh, Margaret and Robert and their four children were sent down the river there, and then they were moved into Louisiana after that and Margaret died about two years later of typhoid in Louisiana. So during the trial, there was very intense coverage both locally and nationally. The um, Cincinnati Gazette was somewhat anti-slavery and they admired the Garners for trying to escape and it was only about two, two days after the account, after the capture, that the Cincinnati Gazette said, there should someday be a sculpture honoring Margaret Garner in the hills of Kentucky. Um, the other side, the most virulent pro-slavery paper then was the Cincinnati Inquirer, and they wanted the escaped slaves to be sent back as soon as possible, and that is what eventually happened, although it, it took quite a while. Frederick Douglass was still running his newspaper in Rochester, uh, and he covered this very intensely for four months. He covered the capture, he covered the trial, he covered the details of when they were sent down river and what happened. Um, he kept covering it in the summer because this was when the Republican Party was uh, forming <clears throat> as a national party for the first time. And he wanted that party to take a strong anti-slavery position and they were only lukewarm at the time because th their main concern was to keep slavery out of the western, new western territories of Kansas and Nebraska. But he and, and uh, the party was not focusing on slavery in the south. They were gonna say, we're not gonna touch that. And he used this account, what this woman had done to show that um, slavery is, is worse than death and to argue that the party should take a stronger uh, position which they finally did in their uh, platform and he, he supported the party that year. After the decision was made, 
Gaines and Marshall and their friends came back over the river in Covington and celebrated Magnolia House, which apparently was on Madison, two blocks south of here. And as part of that celebration, members of that celebration out on the street saw the reporter from the Cincinnati Gazette and assaulted him and nearly killed him for having taken the side of the Garners and the newspapers. And then one year after that, Gaines, Archibald Gaines was here in Covington and he saw Jolliffe, the Cincinnati lawyer on the street. He attacked him uh, by hand and with a whip um, and uh, assaulted him so that he actually uh, had to pay a fine for doing that. Um, so uh, Jolliffe was a very interesting character um, and he had argued not only this case but all the anti-slavery cases he did pro bono without any fee. But the black community of uh, Cincinnati was so grateful to him for his attempt to defend the Garners that they took up a, a large collection and wrote a letter that went with it. And he wrote a letter in response that was published in Frederick Douglass's paper and, and many other places as well. And in thanking them, he said that someday the state of Kentucky will be proud of having given birth to the Garners, my unfortunate clients. I'd also like to review how this case has been treated in history. After the Civil War in 1867, Thomas Noble painted the one famous painting of that called Modern Medea that was reprinted in Harper's Weekly and got national distribution as an engraving. And in that, you have Gaines on one side, Margaret on the other. You can see the real conflict there. Between them on the floor is a dead body, but it's the body of Robert, her husband, and not Mary, her daughter. And still, that's still being published without that being pointed out very much. The one mural that has been done public art is the one we have here on the riverfront in Covington that Robert Dafford did around uh, 2005. And that shows the famous walk across the ice, and it's beautifully done visually. The one problem is that just like Noble's painting, it doesn't distinguish among the different skin tones of the Garner family. In both the painting and the mural, they all have the same dark brown skin, and uh, none of it represents the difference between Margaret and her husband. She was a mulatto and Robert was darker. Um, and the children, where the two daughters were very light-skinned. So there, have been, there was one very influential book, Toni Morrison's uh, Beloved, published in 1987, for which she won the Nobel Prize. And she made clear that she was not basing this on Margaret Garner's story herself. She claimed, which I think is probably true, at that time she'd only read one newspaper account about this enslaved woman in Kentucky who killed her own child to save it from slavery. So Morrison took that as an idea and then used her own imagination to fill out what it would have been like to be enslaved in Kentucky in the 1850s. Um, and that is still the novel that has dealt most um, directly and powerfully with the case. There's also the opera that Cincinnati Opera did in 2005 for which Morrison wrote the libretto with music by Daniel Poor. And it was an amazing event for the city and for the whole community. And this time, Toni Morrison did read about the historical Margaret Garner, and most of the action takes place at the equivalent of the Maplewood Farm, and much of the story that we know is true. But she did take poetic license in several important ways, and the most dramatic one is she had Robert lynched in northern Kentucky, whereas he survived. He accompanied the whole family down the river. He lived through the Civil War, uh, fought some in the Civil War, and was back in Cincinnati in 1870. So it's really weird and unfortunate that Robert has been written out of the story, uh, as has the skin tones of the family, the way it has generally been known. There are two important books, uh, historical accounts, and the first one was Stephen Weisenberger, who um, taught English then in 1999 at UK. And, and he wrote a book called Modern Medea that gave the whole actual history of who these people were. Uh, who was Gaines, who was Marshall, uh, where were, were their plantations in relation to each other, 
uh, all the details about the escape, the trial, um, and the aftermath of the story. It's an incredible piece of work, and we learned a lot about it as we, after we started teaching Morrison's story and wanted to know what really happened. That's still the best account of it. There's a shorter book that was written uh, just three years ago by Nikki Taylor called um, Driven Toward Madness. And that is also an account of what happened with um, some more modern interpretations that is a, a good um, extension of what um, Weisenberger did. There are also two things that have happened at NKU recently that are quite significant as part of the MCRC project um, run by Joan Ferrante, who's a professor of sociology. That um, term MCRC means mourning the creation of racial categories. And they have done two uh, Margaret Garner projects. The first one was a 58 minute video in which NKU students in creative writing and the School of the Arts use their own creativity in a variety of art forms. One of the artistic projects was a 25 minute dance that was choreographed, danced, and composed by NKU students. That dance is just one part of the longer video, but it was actually produced at the Aronoff Center a year later as part of a regional dance festival. It's called uh, Margaret Garner. And for that festival, they had to have um, two professional dancers along with the NKU students, but it's still primarily a student production. So those have updated the Margaret Garner story from the point of view of students who are in their 20s today. And it was fascinating to see that project develop. <laughs>